Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that definitely has not gotten the coverage that it deserves. So I wanted to make sure I spoke on Kathleen's case so that you could see her face and know her story. It's a case that I've been following since the very beginning and I saw how it all unfolded. And unfortunately, it definitely was not the result that I was hoping for, but I'm glad we finally have some answers in this case. But before we get into the case, I wanted to make sure I say a huge thank you to today's sponsor sponsor Harry's. I've been using Harry's for years now, and that's because they're the only razors that I can use for my very sensitive skin. Harry's high quality premium blades were manufactured in their own factory in Germany, and they are complete with a precision trimmer and flex hinge to give you a close, comfortable, and smooth shave. Not only are their blades amazing, but their handle now has a two-tone design that has deeper grooves for improved grip, which makes shaving just that much easier. I also use Harry's foaming shave gel, which is perfect for those of you who have sensitive skin like I do. Their foaming shave gel is made with loving ingredients like aloe and hyaluronic acid. I swear by their razors and their foaming gel. They are the only razor and gel that I can use and not end up with some gnarly razor burn. Harry's is also super convenient, arriving in the mail at your front door so that you never have to leave your house and go to the store and shop around for different razors. They come directly to you. Harry's also has a starter kit that gives you everything that you need for a comfortable close shave. This includes a five blade razor, a weighted handle, a blade cover, and their foaming shave gel. And if for some reason you aren't happy with your product, Harry has a 100% quality guarantee where you'll get 100% of your money back if you aren't happy with your product but I don't think you're gonna need it because I swear by their razors. The exciting news is that you can get your starter kit for only $3 by clicking the link down below and heading over to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon. That's such an amazing deal because you literally get everything that you need for a close, comfortable shave. So again, make sure you click the link down below and head over to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon and get your starter kit for only $3. Thank you again so much to Harry's for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Kathleen Moore. Kathleen Moore, who her friends referred to her as Kit Kat, was born on September 1st, 1987 in Detroit, Michigan, but she grew up with her five siblings in St. Petersburg, Florida. She was 34 years old at the time of her disappearance, and she had been working as a bartender and waitress at the Whiskey Wings Bar and Grill. At the same time, she was taking classes to earn her phlebotomy degree. Her dream was to graduate and start working as a nurse. Friends and family described her as a kind-hearted young woman who showed everyone love. She didn't care about who you were. She didn't care about the color of your skin. She tried to love everybody around her. Friends had said that she truly had gone through a lot of very hard things in life, but despite that, she continued to show kindness and compassion towards those in her life. Now, Kathleen had last been seen on the evening of Sunday, November 28th of 2021. That day, she had been spending time with her best friend of 20 years, Nikki. Her and Nikki had been best friends since they were only 11 years old, so they had a fun day together, which consisted of grilling out during the day, and then in the evening, they went bar hopping around different bars in Largo in Indian Rocks Beach. At some point in the night, Kathleen's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Colin Knapp, showed up and hung out with the group. According to those around them, they had a few different arguments that night, but sometime between 10.30 and 11 p.m., Colin and Kathleen had left the bar to go to Colin's house. Now, Kathleen had driven herself to her friend Nikki's house that night and then went with them to the bars, but they had left the bar and went to Colin's house in his 2006 black Cadillac, and she left her car at Nikki's house. The plan was for Kathleen to stay at his house in Newport Ritchie, and then she was gonna get her car the next day. According to Colin, they got to his house just after midnight on November 29th, but pretty much as soon as they got there, they started arguing about what to eat. Colin said that both him and Kathleen had been intoxicated, but Kathleen had kept asking him over and over again to take her to McDonald's, but he told her that he was too intoxicated to drive her anywhere. So apparently she had gotten really upset and just wanted to leave his house that night, 
So Colin unlocked his car so she could get her backpack out of his car, which had all of her personal belongings in it, so that she could leave on foot and I guess walk home. So she left and she started walking in a direction that apparently Colin did not see sometime between 12.30 and 1 a.m. Once this happened, Colin said that he went back inside to just play some video games. He said that he didn't leave the house the rest of the night, so nothing more really happened after that. He said that he was expecting Kathleen to reach back out to him, but he said that she never texted him to let him know that she got home safely. So that was that, and he really didn't have anything else to say. Now, I do want to know, because I know that a lot of you all are thinking the exact same thing, but how was it that he was too drunk to drive her to McDonald's, but not too drunk to drive her home after they had been drinking at the bars? That doesn't really make sense, does it? By later that morning on November 29th, Nikki had noticed that Kathleen had not come to pick up her car. This immediately concerned her, so she started calling her, but all of her calls were going straight to voicemail. Then Kathleen did not show up for her scheduled work shift that evening, which was very out of character for Kathleen. Her friends also noticed that Kathleen had not posted on her Facebook all day that day, which was very out of character for her. She was known to post on Facebook pretty much every single day, so the fact that she hadn't posted the entire day really started to concern her friends. By the time November 30th rolled around and Kathleen still didn't show up for work, still hadn't contacted anybody, and still hadn't come to pick up her car, her friends and family knew that something had to be wrong. So that same evening on Monday, November 30th, her family reported Kathleen as a missing person to the Pascal County Sheriff's Office. Immediately, police started their searches around Collins' house as well as around the bars that they were last known to be at. They also started questioning everybody in Kathleen's life to figure out what happened on the night that she was last seen. So first, Kathleen's roommate, a 28-year-old named Connor, he talked to police about his last communication with Kathleen. He told police that on November 28th, him and Kathleen had been texting back and forth. He said that at 10, 11 p.m., Kathleen texted him saying that she was being accused of things she's not. He also mentioned that she said that she wanted to find a good guy to be with. He responded to her text, but after that, she stopped responding and he hadn't heard from her since. Then the same day that, you know, the police were starting their investigation, of course, Kathleen's friends and family continue to try and call her and make contact with her. However, that day, one of her friends named Tina had called her phone and by that time, somebody actually answered. This person identified himself as a homeless man who had actually found the cell phone in a dumpster located behind a Walgreens in Newport Ritchie. So, of course, police went ahead and questioned him about the situation. He told police that he stayed in a small camp that was located in the area behind the Walgreens. He said that he did have consent from the Walgreens to search through their dumpster on a regular basis to search for any food or any other items that could be of value to him. Which, side note, props to that Walgreens for being chill about people searching through their dumpster. I know, you know, some businesses will see people searching through the dumpster and, like, tell them to go away and, you know, it's a whole thing, which is really weird, like, why do you care about people searching through your dumpster? But I guess it's kind of cool that, you know, they were okay with it. But either way, this homeless man said that he did look through the dumpster on a daily basis. He said that on November 30th, so that same day at around 11 a.m., he found this cell phone, which was located on the very top of the dumpster, so it was very easily accessible. So it's not like he was like digging through and trying to find something at the bottom. It was literally just placed on the top of the dumpster, so when he went and looked, he just noticed it sitting there. He said that the phone was turned off when he had found it, so he powered it back on, but it was only at 4%, and it was password protected. He also said that the cellular data had been turned off, but he was able to turn it back on without knowing the passcode. He said that he kept this phone with him as he went about his day until he received a phone call, and of course he answered it. That person told him that this phone belonged to a missing person. He said that's when he returned back to the Walgreens to give the phone to a manager there before police came and spoke with him. So at that time, he didn't have possession of the phone, but he pointed police towards the person he gave it to. So clearly, after Kathleen went missing, someone had dumped her phone in the dumpster, 
but unfortunately, Walgreens told police that they didn't have any surveillance videos that actually pointed towards the dumpster, so there was no real way of seeing who the person was responsible for putting her phone in that dumpster. But either way, police continued their interviews with anyone and everyone in Kathleen's circle, and this included her boyfriend, Colin Knapp. Officers arrived at his home for an informal interview that same evening on November 30th. He let the officers enter his home, and again, he told the story that I explained earlier about how the two had been hanging out that night with other friends, and then they came over to his house in New Port Ritchie, but then she left because the two had gotten into an argument. However, during this interview, police noticed that there was a very strong smell of cleaning chemicals within the home. So they went ahead and started walking through the home and Colin let them go pretty much wherever they wanted within the home, with the exception of two bedrooms, which he said that he rented out to his roommate. The officers told Colin that his house smelled like it had freshly been cleaned and he told the officers that he had the day off and he decided to use his day off cleaning his entire house because his dog shed quite a bit. So detectives left there after searching around the house and they decided to look around the neighborhood to see if anybody had any external security videos that captured the street. And fortunately, they were able to find two security videos, so they reviewed the footage and it showed a black Cadillac traveling west on Carmel Avenue, which is where Colin's house is located at 12.15 a.m. on the morning of November 29th. They then saw the same Cadillac going west on Carmel Avenue at 12.21 a.m. as if the car had gone around the block. That same car was then seen traveling east on Carmel Avenue at 1.20 a.m. So the first two times would line up with what he originally told police happened that night that the two got home just after midnight. So for some reason, my video and audio cut off for this next small bit, but either way, as I said, the first two times of Colin leaving the house of his black Cadillac being seen around the block on his street, that was consistent with his original story. However, that third time that his car was seen going east on Carmel Avenue, that is not consistent with the original story that he told police. He told police that he had not left the house after Kathleen had left. However, clearly he did leave at some point after and he lied about it. So later that night, another officer went back to Colin's home for a second interview. This time, the officer asked Colin if he could search his home, his black Cadillac, as well as his truck and trailer that he had for landscaping, and he agreed. They also requested to download the data from his cell phone, which he also consented to. At this time though, the officer also noticed that he had some abrasions on the knuckles on his right hand. When asked about it, Colin said that he got these injuries after he punched something when he got upset after watching an NFL game, which was on the 28th. Then the officer brought up the inconsistencies with what he had originally said with what the surveillance video was showing. So Colin changed his story and he said that him and his friend did play Xbox that night, but he did admit that he did, in fact, leave the house at 1.15 a.m. to drive to his job where he worked at Harold Seltzer's Steakhouse in Port Ritchie. He said that he went there to do an inventory check to see what meat needed to be ordered, after that, he said he went straight home. He also changed his initial story about Kathleen. He told officers that that night after Kathleen had left, she had actually gotten picked up by someone. When police asked him what she was last seen wearing, he described a light blue sweatshirt with a picture of the Rugrats on it. Then police did end up getting at Kathleen's cell phone data and they found a Snapchat picture that she had taken that same night and this confirmed that she was wearing that light blue Rugrats hoodie. So these contradicting statements automatically concern the officers. First, of course, they questioned how was he too intoxicated to drive Kathleen to McDonald's to the point where she left on foot and he refused to drive her, but he wasn't too intoxicated to drive to work to do this random inventory check. They were also concerned that he changed the story about how Kathleen had left. First, he said that she left on foot and then suddenly she got picked up. They also noted that there was no surveillance video that actually showed Kathleen leaving his house and walking down the street and it also didn't show any other car on that street around that time. So that showed that she probably didn't leave on foot and she definitely didn't get picked up by anybody. 
anybody. So going off of this, by December 1st, police went around the various areas where Kathleen was known to last be seen to see if they could find any surveillance video that showed either her or Colin in the area. So they were able to find a surveillance video from Colin's job at Harold Seltzer's that picked up Colin arriving to the location at 1.27 a.m. in his black Cadillac. The video showed him parking his car near a large industrial dumpster at the side of the building, However, the video was too grainy to actually pick up on his movements while he was parked there. But the video did capture him entering the building and staying inside for about 20 minutes before leaving at 1.53 a.m. So then, by December 2nd, the police called waste management to have the dumpster transported to another area where the dumpster could be searched. According to the affidavit, this dumpster is used exclusively by the Harold Zeltzer's restaurants, so there only should be items in that dumpster related to the restaurant. Most of the trash bags were clear that clearly just had discarded food but they ended up finding several large black garbage bags, which clearly looked different from the rest of them, so clearly someone from the restaurant was not the one who dumped them. Upon opening them, they discovered a black and gray bed comforter with a significant amount of blood on it, and then a red bed sheet, which also appeared to have blood on it, and then a mattress cover, which also had a significant amount of blood on it. Additionally, they found Kathleen's credit and debit cards, her car keys, and then a pair of old brown work boots, and then a gray shirt, and then men's cargo pants, which had blood on them. They found a backpack, a black women's bodysuit, three pillowcases, and then a light blue sweatshirt with a picture of the Rugrats on it. Of course, we know that the blue Rugrat sweatshirt definitely stands out because it's the same thing that Kathleen was last known to be wearing when she disappeared. So, police brought Colin into the police station and did yet another interview to show him all of this evidence, and he became very upset and he said that he feels that they're accusing him of something. So he got up and left the building. He started driving on the highway, but police had actually been approved to place a tracking device on his car. So they were able to see where he was going. And this device showed that he had driven up north and then out of the state of Florida. Then all of this evidence was sent to the lab for further testing. And of course, all of this blood came back as belonging to Kathleen. So based on that, police believed that Kathleen Moore had faced fatal injuries at the hands of Colin Knapp within his home in the early morning hours of November 29th, 2021. So, of course, all of this evidence points us directly to Colin as being responsible for murdering Kathleen, but at this point, there's no body, and there's no information telling us why he would have wanted to harm Kathleen in the first place. So, according to friends and family, Kathleen and Colin had a bit of a tumultuous relationship. They were known to have very frequent arguments, and Colin was known to be much more angry and violent anytime he would drink. People have said that they've seen Colin turn into a completely different person when he gets drunk. But beyond that, Colin does have a bit of a criminal record. So, back in May, of 2010, Colin had been arrested and charged with aggravated battery. Then, three years after that, he was arrested and charged for a misdemeanor count of domestic battery. Then, 10 months after that, he was arrested once again for this time a felony charge of domestic battery. Then, at this time, Colin was also charged with reckless driving. Then, he was also found to be in the possession of MDMA, cocaine, and other drug paraphernalia. Then, between the years of 2013 and 2015, he has several other charges involving possession of drugs such as cocaine, alprazolam, meth, and drug paraphernalia. So, given all of these charges, I do believe he was on probation for a period of time, but other than that, I don't believe he ever actually served any jail time. Either way, based on all of this evidence that they were able to find, they were finally able to arrest and charge Colin Knapp for second-degree murder. Once this happened, police held a press conference to speak directly to the public and say that they're hoping that they can get more information that leads them to discovering where Kathleen's body is. They said that Colin has been acting very cold and he's completely unwilling to cooperate with investigators to lead them to where Kathleen's body is. They said that they've been begging Colin for information that will lead them to finding Kathleen's body, but he just won't give it up. So they asked the public for help in finding Kathleen's body, and this plea did seem to help. By December 6, 2021, an individual who was searching for Kathleen was walking through a wooded area near Colin Knapp's home on Carmel Avenue when they discovered what looked like a body. Immediately, this person called police who arrived shortly on the scene. 
they discovered a body that was located about 50 yards northeast of Colin's home, laying on the ground, covered in dirt and leaves in a very heavily bushed area. Police said that it was obvious that this person tried to cover the body. Then, unfortunately, based on the tattoos that were found on the body, this person was identified as being Kathleen Moore. Now, if you all remember Dwayne the dog Chapman, the bounty hunter who had participated in the search for Brian Laundry, he came out and said that it was a member of his team who ended up finding Kathleen's body. Police came out and said that they actually did search this same area with cadaver dogs, but they were unable to find her because she had been purposely hidden. They explained that there's a lot of factors that go into whether a dog will be able to find a body, including the weather, the wind, and other environmental conditions. So they said that even though the dogs were trying their best, they just weren't able to find her, but police said that they are very happy with the public's efforts in trying to find her body so that they can finally bring some closure to Kathleen's family. After the discovery of her body, Kathleen's family had come out to say that they're praying for Kathleen, but that they're also praying for Colin's family, which I think is just such a compassionate and strong thing to say. It's clear that Kathleen was surrounded by just the most amazing people who truly have so much love to give. So I've seen at the time that I'm recording this video that the autopsy results have not been released. But according to a document filed with the Sixth Judicial Circuit Court for the Pascal County, Colin Knapp is being charged with second degree murder by shooting Kathleen with a firearm. So I'm assuming that it was probably obvious by the way her body was found that she was shot. Either that or Colin admitted to it, I'm not exactly sure. But I don't wanna to speculate too much. I don't wanna hurt the case by you know, trying to throw out theories. It doesn't really help the case at this point because her murderer is being charged. So I'll just leave it at that. But at the end of the day, I'm really happy that police in this case tried their absolute hardest to find out what exactly happened to Kathleen. It was nice just reading through the affidavit and just seeing how they were able to investigate this entire case from the jump and how that resulted in actually finding her murderer. Unfortunately, this is yet another case of domestic violence that simply should never have happened, but I am very happy that police did do their due diligence in finding out what happened to her and arresting the man responsible. My heart goes out to Kathleen and her family. I'm so sad that she was just about to graduate and start a new career. I'm sure she was so excited to finally be done with school and finally start working in a career that she was passionate about. I don't know exactly what took place that night, but my assumption is that they were arguing, it got out of control, and instead of just letting her leave and going about the rest of her night and returning home safely, he decided to take her life from her, which is absolutely terrifying, and I hope he stays behind bars as long as possible. If there is a trial that comes out of this, of course, I will keep you all up to date on the result of that. As far as I've found, there hasn't been a trial date set yet, so I will let you all know once we find out more. But either way, that is all of the information that I have for today's video, so if you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you click the link down below and head over to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon to get your starter kit for only three dollars. Make sure to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!